I'm going to tell you a story. Would you like to hear it? Good. It's called The Worst Witch. Chapter 1. Miss Cackle's Academy of Witches stood at the top of a high mountain surrounded by a pine forest. It looked more like a prison than a school with its gloomy grey walls and turrets. Sometimes you could see the pupils on their broomsticks flitting like bats above the playground wall, but usually the place was half hidden in mist, so that if you had glanced up at the mountain, you would probably not have noticed the building was there at all. Everything about the school was dark and shadowy. There were long, narrow corridors and winding staircases and of course there were the girls themselves dressed in black gym slips, black stockings, black hobnail boots, grey shirts and black and grey ties. Lots of black. Even their summer dresses were black and grey checked. The only touches of colour were the sashes round their gym slips, a different colour for each house, and the school badge, which was a black cat sitting on a yellow moon. For special occasions, such as Halloween or prize giving, there was another uniform consisting of a long robe worn with a tall pointed hat but as these were black too it didn't really make much of a change there were so many rules that you couldn't do anything without being told off and there seemed to be tests and exams every week mildred hubble was in her first year at the school she was one of those people who always seemed to be in trouble. She didn't exactly mean to break the rules and annoy the teachers. But things just seemed to happen whenever she was around. 
you could rely on Mildred to have her hat on back to front or her bootlaces trailing along the floor. She couldn't walk from one end of the corridor to another without someone yelling at her and nearly every night she was writing lines or being kept in. Not that there was anywhere to go if she were allowed out. Anyway, she had lots of friends even if they did keep their distance in the potion library and her best friend Maud stayed loyally by her side through everything even though it could be hair raising. They made a funny pair for Mildred was tall and thin with long plaits which she often chewed absent-mindedly another thing she would get told off for while Maud was short and tubby had round glasses and wore her hair in bunches who are you? Hey. Who are you? Hey. Who are you? Monsters Don't Eat Broccoli by Barbara G. Hinks. The waitress in the restaurant just doesn't have a clue. Monsters don't eat broccoli. How could she think we do? We'd rather snack on tractors or a rocket ship or two or tender trailer tidbits or a wheelie steely stew. Fum fi fo fi. Monsters don't eat broccoli. Monsters don't eat broccoli or artichokes or greens. We can't abide sprouts or slimy lima beans. But redwoods are delectable and boulders, what a treat! And a fountain so refreshing in this dreadful summer heat. Fum fi fo fi. Monsters don't eat broccoli. Aliens love underpants of every shape and size, but there are no underpants in space, so here's a big surprise. When aliens fly down to Earth, they don't come to meet you. They simply want your underpants. I bet you never knew. Their spaceship's radar bleeps and blinks. The moment that it sees a washing line of underpants or flapping in the breeze. They land in your back garden, though they haven't been invited. Ooh, underpants, they chant and dance around delighted. They like them red, they like them green or orange like satsumas. But best of all, they love the sight of Granny's spotted bloomers. Who are you? Who are you? Who are you? Who are you? A story by Dragonfly. There was a beetle in the bathroom. When I peeped around the door, I couldn't believe the things I saw. A caterpillar was washing his hair with my shampoo. I don't think that's fair. An earwig was using Dad's aftershave and a woodlouse saw me and started to wave. A ladybird was skiing a zigzag path down the smooth and slippery sides of our bath. A beetle was singing songs in the shower. He must have been there for over an hour. A centipede was soaking his feet and cutting his nails looking quite neat. A spider bungee jumped from the sink where ants had discovered a skating rink and by the mirror a butterfly was dabbing makeup around each eye and I was waiting to use the loo so I shouted out 
Hey, all of you! When you've all finished splashing and splashing, slipping and sliding, crashing and dashing, shaving and waving and misbehaving, can I come in for just one minute? Please? The end. Who are you? Hey, who are you? Hey. Good morning everyone and welcome to a special edition of this morning. I'm going to be reading one of my daughter's favourite books and it's called Tilly and the Time Machine and it's by Adrian Edmondson. Some of you might have heard of him because he is a famous comedian as well. Are you ready Phil? Tilly and the Time Machine. Chapter 1 The Explosion in the middle of the night, there was a loud explosion. Tilly woke up with a start. At first, she didn't know whether the bang she heard was part of a dream or something that happened in real life. She lay under her duvet, looking this way and that, trying to see the things in her dark room. She really wanted to find out what had made the loud noise, but it was freezing cold that night and she really didn't want to get out of the bed covers. Suddenly, through the gap in her thin curtains, she saw a shower of sparks which lit up her tiny bedroom. It was as if someone had set off a large firework just outside her window. In the light of the spark, she, should, she could see Big Teddy and Mr Fluffy Bunny sitting on the shelf at the end of her bed. She could also see her uniform laid out on the chair behind the door, ready for school in the morning. And she could see the big photo of her with her mummy and her dad which she'd kept in a frame by her bedside table. The photo had been taken in the kitchen downstairs and they all had been looking very happy. Tilly's house was what her dad called an old fashioned two up, two down, which meant it had two rooms upstairs and two rooms downstairs. Though this wasn't strictly true, there was just her bedroom and her dad's bedroom upstairs, but downstairs there was a living room, a kitchen and a new bit of house that stuck out of the back which was their bathroom. There was another explosion, but much smaller this time, a bit like a crump, followed by different coloured showers of sparks. Tilly sniffed the air with her tiny button nose. She could smell something burning. She would have to go down and investigate. Phil, I know you're on the edge of your seat. Have you enjoyed that? Thank you, everybody. One day, Mr Wolf was feeling hungry. He fancied some pancakes. Yum, yum, he said, licking his lips at the thought of a big pile of fresh, delicious pancakes. Mr Wolf had never made pancakes before, so he took his big recipe book down off the shelf and looked inside. But wolves can't read very well and Mr Wolf had trouble making sense of it. So he went to get some help from his neighbours. He called on Chicken Licking who lived nearby. Please can you help me read this? he asked. No, said Chicken Licking. Hi, this banana is going to read The Beast of Buckingham Palace by David Walliams. It was noon and the sky was dark. There has been darkness over the kingdom for half a century. For many years before, the people of the earth had not taken care of their homes. They had burned down all the forests, reduced the last trees to ash. 
They had pumped the rivers, lakes and seas full of waste, killing all the fish. They had dug deeper and deeper under the ground for oil until the plant's planet was hollow as its, to its core. Eventually, the earth took its revenge. The ice caps of the Arctic and the Antarctic melted. The floods were so mighty that whole countries became submerged under water. Violent earthquakes shook entire cities to the ground. All that was left behind was piles and piles of rubble. Volcanoes erupted, pumping billions of tons of ash into the air. Without the sunlight, the crops withered and died. Nothing could grow. The kingdom was plunged into an eternal winter. It was the only world Alfred knew. He was already 12 years old, but he had never even seen sunlight. Often, he dreamed how it must be to feel the sun on his face or run through a field of tall grass, or swim in a sunlit sea. But it was just that, a dream. The boy had seen pictures of the sun in books and marvelled at it, a perfect circle of gold. Now the moon and stars had become invisible too. Alfred would, would spend hours and hours imagining how the night sky must have looked with a thousand little lights twinkling through the blackness. He was one of those children who liked nothing more than being alone with his imagination. In truth, he had little choice, having been sickly his whole life. Soon after he was born, he became ill. As a baby, Alfred had not been expected to survive, but surely he did. Just. The child was as pale as snow and as thin as dust. He, wrote, he wore thick glasses to aid his poor eyesight. Often, Alfred was so weak he had to stay in bed all day. Thank goodness all around him his bed was piled and piled and piled with books and books and books and more books. Books about animals, books about space. Books about trees, books about dinosaurs, books about books. Books about history were his favourite favourite. The trouble was that there was a strict curfew in the building where Alfred lived. Night was the most dangerous time. That was when there was more, most chance of an attack from the outside. Lights had to be out at 8 o'clock sharp by order of the king. Anyone caught with lights on would be severely punished. Punishment was brutal in this kingdom. Those in power had returned to medieval forms of torture. The thumbscrew, the iron maiden, the breaking wheel, the pillory, the rack, the scholar's bride, the rat's dungeon, the head crusher and the iron chair. Who are you? Hey, who are you? Hey, who are you? Ahoy, landlubbers, I be pirate. I've asked ye and listened to my story about Boris's big bogey. When Boris sailed the seven seas on the pirate ship Black Rose, in sun or storm he always kept one finger up his nose. Yes, even as he scrubbed the decks or trimmed the captain's hair, he still picked great big bogies out and flicked them in the air. Captain Shiver Me Timbers, he let out a sudden cry. Look here upon this chart, my lads, do you see what I spy? A far off treasure island, what's not been seen afore? We'll go and search for pirate's gold upon its distant shore. But it wasn't an island, no, no, no. It wasn't an island, yo ho ho. That sticky scrap on the pirate map was Boris's big bogey. But magic things can happen at sea where storm winds rage and roar. They sailed and sailed for many a day until at last they saw a strange uncharted island with cliffs all grim and grey. So they came to Bogey Island and they moored at Bogey Bay. Then Captain Shiver Me Timbers stood upon the swaying bridge 
and with his big brass spying us, he scanned each rock and ridge. I see a cave all dank and dark above the foaming tide. A pirate's cavern, that's for sure, with treasure deep inside. But it wasn't a cave, oh no, no. It wasn't a cavern, yo ho ho. But a glob of goo in his telescope view from Boris's big bogey. Who are you? Who are you? Who are you? Who are you? Hello. Today, I'm going to read Monkey Puzzle. I've lost my mum. Hush, little monkey. Don't you cry. I'll help you find her, said Butterfly. Let's have a think. How big is she? She's big, said the monkey. Bigger than me. Bigger than you? Then I've seen your mum. Come, little monkey, come, come, come. No, 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 that's an elephant. My mum isn't a great grey hunk. She hasn't got tusks or a curly trunk. She doesn't have great thick baggy knees. In any way, her tail coils round trees. She coils round trees? Then she's very near. Quick, little monkey, she's over here. No, 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 that's a snake. Mum doesn't look a bit like this. She doesn't sliver about and hiss. She doesn't curl round a nest of eggs. And anyway, my mum's got more legs. It's legs we're looking for, you say. I know where she is. Come this way. Who are you? Who are you? Who are you? Who are you? Hello, I'm a worm. Today I'm going to be reading a chapter from The Twits written by Roald Dahl. The chapter is called Wormy Spaghetti. I hope you enjoy it. The next day, to pay Mr. Twit back for the frog trick, Mrs. Twit sneaked out into the garden and dug up some worms. She chose big, long ones and put them in a tin and carried the tin back to the house under her apron. At one o'clock, she cooked spaghetti for lunch and mixed the worms in the spaghetti, but only on her husband's plate. The worms didn't show because everything was covered with tomato sauce and sprinkled with cheese. Hey, my spaghetti's moving, cried Mr. Twit, poking it with a fork. It's a new kind, said Mrs. Twit, taking a mouthful from her own plate, which, of course, had no worms. It's called squiggly spaghetti. It's delicious. Eat it up while it's nice and hot. Mr. Twit started eating, twisting the long tomato covered strings around his fork and shoveling them into his mouth. Soon there was tomato sauce all over his hairy chin. It's not as good as the ordinary kind, he said, talking with his mouth full. It's too squishy. I find it very tasty, Mrs. Twit said. She was watching him from the other side of the table. It gave her great pleasure to know that he was eating worms. I find it rather bitter, Mr. Twit said. It's got a distinctly bittery flavour. Buy the other kind next time. Mrs. Twit waited until Mr. Twit had eaten this whole plateful. Then she said, You want to know why your spaghetti was so squishy? Mr. Twit wiped the tomato sauce from his beard with a corner of the tablecloth. Why? he said. Because it was worms! cried Mrs. Twit, clapping her hands and stamping her feet on the floor and rocking with horrible laughter. <laughs> I hope you wouldn't eat wormy spaghetti. Bye! Who are you? 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 The last time.
time we saw Charlie, he was riding high above his hometown in the Great Glass Lift. Only a short while before, Mr. Wonka had told him that the whole gigantic fabulous chocolate factory was his. And now our small friend was returning in triumph with his entire family to take over. The passengers in the lift, just to remind you, were Charlie Bucket, our hero, Mr. Willy Wonka, chocolate maker extraordinaire, Mr. and Mrs. Bucket, Charlie's father and mother, Grandpa Joe, Grandma Josephine, Grandpa George, and Grandma Georgina. Grandma Josephine, Grandma Georgina, and Grandpa George were still in bed, the bed having been pushed on board just before takeoff. Grandpa Joe, as you remember, had gotten out of bed to go around the chocolate factory with Charlie. The great glass lift was a thousand feet up and cruising nicely. The sky was a brilliant blue. Everybody on board was wildly excited at the thought of going to live in the famous chocolate factory. Grandpa Joe was singing. Charlie was jumping up and down. Mr. and Mrs. Bucket were smiling for the first time in years and the three old ones in the bed were grinning at one another with pink, toothless grins. Who are you? Hey, who are you? Hey, who are you? Hello, everyone. So today I am going to be reading my favourite book, The Worst Witch by Jill Murphy. And as you know, witches and cats are the best of friends. So, here we go, chapter one. Miss Cackle's Academy for Witches stood at the top of a high mountain surrounded by a pine forest. It looked more like a prison than a school, with its gloomy grey walls and turrets. Sometimes you could see the pupils on their broomsticks flitting like bats above the playground wall, but usually the place was half hidden in mist. So that if you had glanced up at the mountain, you would probably not have noticed the building was there at all. Everything about the school was dark and shadowy. There were long, narrow corridors and winding staircases. And of course there were the girls themselves, dressed in black gym slips, black stockings, black hobnail boots, grey shirts and black and grey ties. Even their summer dresses were black and grey checked. The only touches of colour were the sashes around their gym slips, a different colour for each house, and the school badge, which was a black cat sitting on a yellow moon. For special occasions, such as prize giving or Halloween, there, were, uh, there was another uniform consisting of a long robe worn with a tall, pointed hat. But as these were black too, it didn't really make much of a change. There were so many rules that you couldn't do anything without being told off and there seemed to be tests and exams every week. Well I don't know about you but that school doesn't sound like the most inviting place does it? Thankfully we all go to Ling Primary School and that's a much much better school. I wonder if you can tell who this is? Who are you? Who are you? The departure day arrived, driving rain and a bitter wind. Bart only went to see Tanglebeard in Riddle for one last time and felt the old familiar pain. Is this what grown up was all about? Letting go and saying goodbye? Does it always have to be like this? Then he returned to the beach, clambered into one of the long boats and wedged himself between the black eye and another baby. At just ten days old, they were as big as five-year-olds, and they jostled him for space, like cookies in a nest. Snowbone was in the next boat. You could see her eyes shining, tail as pearls. She waved when she saw him and grinned. Suddenly, the boat was pushed out onto the waves. The pirates were heaving on the oars. The beach was receding. Who are you? Who are you? Hey, who are you? Hey, hey, who are you? The Dinosaur That Pooped a Princess by Tom Fletcher 
Once upon a time, Danny was riding his dinosaur steed in search for a princess who longed to be freed. But soon they were lost in fairy tale land. They asked for directions from a gingerbread man. Gingerbread man, oh gingerbread man, show us the way we should go if you can. The gingerbread man scratched his gingerbread head. He thought for a moment, then suddenly said, I can't remember, my brain's made of dough. But go ask the three little pigs, they might know. Then as they set off down the yellow brick track, Dinosaur ate the gingerbread for a snack. They soon came across the three little pigs, rebuilding their house of brick, straw and twigs. The three little pigs, oh three little pigs, the princess needs help, do you know where she is? The three little pigs made a little pig huddle, but they couldn't agree and they were all in a muddle. She's this way, she's that way, she's down there. That Who are you? Who are you? Hey. Who are you? Hey. Chapter 1. The Boy Who Lived Mr and Mrs Dursley of number 4 Privet Drive were proud to say they were perfectly normal. Thank you very much. They were the last people you'd expect to be involved in anything strange or mysterious because they didn't hold with such nonsense. Mr Dursley was the director of a firm called Grunnings which made drills. He was a big, beefy man with hardly any neck, although he did have a very large moustache. Mrs Dursley was thin and blonde and nearly twice the usual amount of neck, which came very useful as she spent so much of her time craning over garden fences, spying on the neighbours. The Dursleys had a small son called Dudley, and in their opinion there was no finer boy anywhere. The Dursleys had everything they wanted, but they also had a secret, and their greatest fear was that someone would discover it. They didn't think they could bear if anyone found out about the Potters. Who are you? Who are you? Hey. Who are you? Hey.